Afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone had good lunches and uh, that I'm going to give you something to digest on. So uh, I'm here to talk to you about the only thing in the world that's more interesting than blockchain, space. Uh, so just to introduce myself, uh, I'm one of the founding partners of Seraphim Space, which is the world's uh, only venture fund focused on space tech. Uh, I'm uh, also a crypto enthusiast, having been involved since 2013. So amazed that finally the confluence of the two worlds that I'm interested in has, uh, has resulted in, in uh, this, uh, this event today and with me giving the chance to, to, to speak. So what I'm going to cover in my talk is to try and help everyone understand some of what we see as being the most exciting changes that are currently affecting the, the space sector, how that relates to investment opportunities, and where we might see some opportunities for a uh, confluence of, of uh, the application of, of blockchain technology for some of these space applications. So first things first, why space? Well, because it's cool again. Um, that's the first reason. So if it's good enough for, for Hollywood, then um, surely it's good enough for, for, for the likes of, uh, of, of you, and, uh, you and me, I guess. Actually, I think space has always been cool, but um, Hollywood's just remembering that. Uh, and it's not just Hollywood that's interested in this. It's some of the most successful technologists of our generation are deploying very significant amounts of their own personal wealth into trying to push forward um, uh, the advent of, uh, of the new age of, of, of space, and particularly the commercial age of, of space. So uh, if, again, if it's good enough for the, for the likes of the founders of, of Amazon, Microsoft, and SpaceX, then again, they must be onto something. So why is it that all of these tech billionaires are putting billions of dollars of their own wealth into developing their own space initiatives? Uh, because our firm view is that space's PC moment is here now, just to explain what we mean by that. So we think that there is a, a broadly relevant analogy of looking at the, the, the change over previous decades from mainframe computers to PCs and then ultimately to, uh, to smartphones. And that actually in terms of what that change in price, performance and form factor is meant is just a flourishing of the digital economy that we see today. So how's that relevant to space? Well, 10 years ago, a satellite would have been the size of a small car. It would have raised, weighed hundreds, if not thousands of kilos and would have cost hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to, to build and launch. The kind of things that we're investing in now are taking the kind of components that you will find in every smartphone in every one of your pockets and using that to build satellites that are the size of a shoebox and can cost below $100,000 to, to build and launch. So that's a really profound change in the fundamental economics of space. It means for the first time that you're able to actually look to a relatively modest cost for less than the equivalent of one of these satellites 10 years ago, launch constellations of potentially hundreds of satellites. So the amount of data that you're able to collect and communicate about the Earth from space has just increased several orders of magnitude. And that has some profound implications in terms of the ripple effect that that data can have, not just on the space sector, but further afield. When you then start to layer on top of that the convergence of, of things like artificial intelligence and being able to actually uh, uh, analyze all of these data sets at scale, cloud computing, and I guess more, more recently, potentially um, uh, blockchain, all of those things combined really mean that we're seeing what we perceive to be a once in a generational change in, in the space sector that is catalyzing just tremendous amounts of, of, of innovation. So what do these massive changes in the economics of space mean? Um, well, put simply, it means that space has gone from being a sector that no VC would ever be interested in, uh, namely one that required huge amounts of money, took an incredibly long period of time to find out whether you're gonna be successful or not, and was heavily reliant on number one, government support, and number two, innovation from incumbents. That's not generally a recipe for success in the venture world. Whereas now, the kind of businesses that we're looking at, to our mind, look extremely similar to those of any tech segment. They're businesses that can scale quickly, that can, with a relatively modest amount of money, hit some really important proof points and, and validation. Uh, that are able to iterate much, much more rapidly. Good case in point, one of our portfolio companies, Spire, um, they are uh, uh, four years into launching their f since they launched their first satellite. They're now on about their sixth or seventh generation of satellites. Their sixth or seventh generation is many times more powerful and better and cheaper than their first generation. You compare that to a typical satellite program from a decade ago, and you wouldn't even have your first satellite uh, in, in, in orbit. But perhaps most importantly, what all of these changes have meant 
is that now innovation and change within this sector is being driven by the likes of the people in this room. It's, it's, it's young startups, it's innovators, it's not big companies that are driving the change. And for us, that's just tremendously exciting. And what we're already seeing is that there's a, an amazing ecosystem that is really flourishing around the, the, the kind of dynamics that I've alluded to. So uh, this is a, a, a piece of research that we've actually put out. You can get it on our, our, our website, which is meant to just be an illustration of just how broad this innovation is happening. And it really is right across the ecosystem. So that starts with people that are doing interesting things with developing new sensors, uh, finding new ways using um, 3D printing and robotics to, to, to build satellites, to build drones, to build rockets. Um, it's people that are finding interesting ways to, to, to launch things into, uh, in, into space, including most recently a space catapult, which, um, yeah, is going to take a bit of explaining to, to, to me, quite frankly. Uh, and then mo perhaps more, most importantly, as I've already alluded to, it's people being able to actually put up very large constellations of, uh, of satellites at, at very low cost to just capture huge amounts of data. But then, of course, all of that data needs to be got back down to Earth. So you're seeing lots of innovation around things like laser communications, and downlink technologies and an antennas for being able to actually cost effectively get all of this data down to earth. Right now, this is such a big problem that most of these constellations have to throw away upwards of 99% of all the data they capture, which is just crazy. Uh, and then once you've got it down to earth, then there's a huge cost to actually storing and processing this data. So this is where you start to see some of the, the advents around cloud computing and uh, latest generation of, uh, of, of high performance um, uh, chips having a real application in the space sector and that this is one of the biggest areas of, of, of cost. Uh, and you're also seeing lots of innovation in what people are doing with all of this data. So applying the latest uh, developments in, in, in deep learning and other forms of AI to be able to try and extract really useful insight that you otherwise can't get. Uh, and then you're also seeing people that, are, that don't even think of themselves as being space businesses who are taking some of this data and some of this analysis, fusing it with a whole bunch of other terrestrial data sets and then turning it into a product that many of us use on a routine basis, like City Mapper, City Mapper for example, um, as, as, as a great example. Uh, and of course, there's also lots of perhaps longer term, uh, but, but perhaps uh, more visionary things that are going on with what we consider the outward looking elements of the space sector. So these are the people, um, I guess Elon Musk at top of the list, um, who have their sights firmly set on uh, making us an interplanetary species. Uh, likewise, the exploitation of space-based assets and a whole range of other things in, in between. So, what do some of these opportunities mean in terms of the kind of things that you can now use space to, to do? And I think one of the ways that we look at this, and I'll return to this point later, is try and think about what can you only do from space? So, one of the things that you can only do from space, and you can only do if you've got a large constellation of satellites that can revisit and capture data about any particular point on Earth or above Earth on a really regular basis, is get a much deeper and better understanding about the weather systems that affect all of our lives. So natural disasters are one of the most pronounced problems for, for mankind, um, uh, cost millions of lives each year and tens of billions of, of dollars. The kind of companies that we're backing have been able to get a much more accurate and granular view of everything that's happening around um, uh, our, our weather systems and also, also our climate. Uh, enabling a whole range of new and interesting applications, some of which do have relevance to, uh, to, to blockchain technologies. You're also able to, to, with all of this data, address some of the other major problems that are facing the planet. So, for example, by 2050, there's going to be twice as many people on Earth, and we don't have twice as much arable land. So we've got to find a way to more effectively farm and produce the food that's going to sustain everyone. The satellites have a huge role to play in this. An example here of this very odd-looking heat map is actually a, a way of identifying crop health uh, as a way of then uh, being more efficient in terms of your use of uh, pesticides and, uh, and also watering your plants. You can also start to, to get just a much more granular insight into the heartbeat of, of global economic activity. So, for example, being able to identify the flow of trade when uh, an oil tanker is leaving port, um, what it might be carrying, how many cars there are in, 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 in a particular parking lot, all of these things that you can only really measure at scale and with regularity from, from space that is enabling a huge new range of, uh, of applications, ultimately with the aim of driving more efficient global trade. Uh, and of course, it's, it's consumer facing as well. So many of the technologies and, and applications that we rely on today from everything from broadcast TV to the internet to mobile telephony, and perhaps uh, more pertinently, location-based services such as, as Uber fundamentally 
cannot work without the kind of technologies that, that I've, been, I've, be, I've been alluding to. And as we look forwards over the next couple of decades, actually our reliance on these kind of space data, data, data sets and assets is only going to grow more, more profoundly as we look at the, the way in which things like transport's going to change uh, and the advent of autonomous vehicles and, and, and drones. None of that is possible without, um, without the kind of things that, that I've been talking about. Another area that, that really you can only really address from, from space, and again, if we're looking at things that can have a meaningful impact on, on mankind over forthcoming decades, it's only really from space that you can deliver ubiquitous connectivity to anywhere on Earth. So there's more than two billion people today that don't have access to the internet, that over the next 10 years, all of those people should be able to get online by virtue of uh, the kind of businesses that are putting up hundreds and thousands of, of, of satellites. So that's two billion more people who can use the internet to learn, to communicate, uh, to, to innovate, and to, to transact. Uh, we think that is, 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 is a tremendous area of promise. I alluded to, this to, alluded to this already. I think this is probably something that's a, a little further away, probably a little further away than, than even the, the, the leading visionaries would think. But ultimately, there is a path for, in perhaps our lifetimes, uh, seeing the first baby steps towards establishing ourselves as an interplanetary species, and what could be more interesting than that. So, bringing it back to um, what it means from an investment perspective, uh, so it's not just us that have cottoned on to the fact that this is a really exciting area to, to be investing in. You can see here that actually the rate of investment from VCs around the world has grown very significantly, so, uh, and again, this is based on our own research, uh, that in the last two years alone, there's been more venture money invested into this sector, many of it into things like SpaceX, than has been invested in the preceding 15 years combined. So, although there are lots of people investing in this, they're investing in this as, as generalists that are just interested in, in, in finding nascent technology investment opportunities rather than being sector specialists. As I alluded to at the start of my talk, Seraphim is the world's only uh, space tech venture fund, which it's kind of crazy when you think about the fact that the space sector is a $300 billion industry today that's expected to grow to a trillion dollars. Um, so we're, we're a step in the right direction in, in being a dedicated fund, um, less than $100 million committed. Um, besides myself, the fund is, uh, is run by a number of the, the space sector's most successful entrepreneurs. So the guy who invented Google Earth, um, or invented the technology that he sold to Google Earth and then built at Google Earth, is one of my partners. Um, likewise, a guy who uh, built one of the first uh, satellite businesses that used uh, pictures or taking pictures to, to develop geo geospatial intelligence, um, which he grew to a billion dollar business. We've also got significant backing from the industry itself. So some of Europe's biggest uh, uh, space companies like Airbus uh, and, and SES uh, are partners with us, as indeed are both the, the UK and European space agencies. So we're, we're very proud to be a London headquartered uh, funds, but albeit with a, with a not surprisingly global, uh, global view. We're, we're an early stage investor, albeit that definition really depends on whose perspective it's coming from. Uh, what it means to us is we're normally the first or second investor to, to, to come into a, a business investing uh, low millions of, of, of pounds at our initial investment and up to 10 over, over a more prolonged time frame. Uh, and we've not just set up the world's only uh, space tech fund, uh, we've also recognized that the overall ecosystem needs a massive amount of support and that actually a very significant amount of the really amazing uh, innovation that we see happening is still at a very nascent stage, too early for us as a fund. So we've set up a couple of other initiatives. Um, uh, we've, uh, we've set up a, a space tech angel network specializing in this area, both in the UK and across Europe. Uh, and more recently, we've launched the world's first um, space tech focused uh, accelerator, the imaginatively named Seraphim Space Camp, which is currently underway. Uh, and I think the first cohort was announced yesterday. So if you go on TechCrunch, I'm sure you can find some, some detail about that. Right, so what's our view of, of, of this really um, uh, amazing sector to be, to be investing in? Uh, I've covered a bit of this al already, but our overriding thesis is that we're really focused on backing businesses that observe, connect, and guide the Earth from above, as illustrated here. The more astute of you will notice that um, it's not just satellites, it's also drones and, and UAVs, which might seem slightly odd as someone who says they work uh, and run a, a space fund. Uh, the reason for that is, is really twofold. Um, if you actually look at what goes into building one of these shoebox-sized satellites, and then you go and look at what goes into building a DJI drone, it's actually remarkably similar. It's using much of the same componentry leverage from the consumer electronics industry, tapping into Moore's law, that is able to build these really low-cost devices that can, can now capture huge amounts of information. 
And also, equally importantly, we like to work back from what the customer need is, uh, what their problem is, and how you can solve it. Um, and believe it or not, not many people want to buy a satellite or a drone image because they don't really know what to do with it. What they want is to um, have a solution to their problem, and they don't really care how you do it. And very frequently, what we find in that context is that it's a combination of satellites and drones in concert rather than a, a sort of either-or binary decision that's solving these problems. So from that perspective, it's vital that we consider drones part of our, our, our remit. So that's our, our fundamental focus. Beneath that, we then look to invest in all of the technology building blocks that enable these platforms. So uh, that's the kind of things that are building sensors that I've alluded to. Um, we haven't invested in rocket ships. We've looked at a lot of them. Um, uh, we also look at things that are helping with downlinking the data, storing it, uh, and, and analyzing as being, being key areas. Uh, and actually across pretty, pretty much every vertical and sector you can, can think of, albeit we try to identify businesses that, that recognize you need to focus on one area uh, as you prove out, your, prove out your business. So what do we, what do we look for? A few things. Um, we, we do invest in satellites, but we're, we're primarily interested in the data that those satellites are, are generating. So hardware the tool and data the business is absolutely a key theme for us. We try to, to look for businesses that are capturing unique and proprietary data sets. Uh, and we like businesses that have got some defensible IP and at the point that we're investing have achieved some technical validation. That can become a little bit uh, uh, challenging if you're looking to back a business that's putting things into orbit and hasn't yet done it. Um, we also like businesses that are vertically integrated, that recognize that in this new world where it costs several orders of magnitude less to build, build out a space constellation, you shouldn't just be looking to build a space constellation. That's a very difficult challenge in its own right. You've also got to build a data analytics business alongside it in order to, to really capture the, the, the value. Uh, and naturally, we look for great teams, large markets. Uh, that's kind of a given as a, as, as a venture fund. So what have we seen in the 18 months since we've been, we've been operational? Just an amazing amount of, of investment opportunities. So uh, about 100 a month on, on average. So uh, the better part of 2,000 um, companies now, of which we've only invested in six. I'm afraid that kind of success rate is fairly typical for, for, for venture funds. What that has given us is a, is a really privileged panoptic view of all of the innovation that's happening in, in this sector. So we've looked at more than a dozen different rocket launches. We've looked at now about 50 um, would-be constellations, uh, a lot of drone companies, a lot of AI companies that are looking to, to use uh, all of this data in, in, in interesting ways. And it's really taken us aback about just how broad the innovation is within the sector, but also the fact it's happening on a truly global basis. Um, uh, with, with actually the UK, relatively speaking, at the epicenter of that, that innovation, which um, I guess is a pretty unusual dynamic in the context of the, the global tech industry. So what are some of the observations from, from all of these companies that, that we've seen? Well, I've touched on some of these already. We just see innovation everywhere. Um, uh, we're seeing growing amounts of investor appetite. Uh, if you can name a, a, a sort of high-profile US uh, venture fund, they've all invested in at least one space business, and most of them have only done that within the last 12 months. Uh, we think that we're just at the start of a multi-decade trend and that this is still a, a very embryonic ecosystem, uh, and, uh, and, and that as we start this journey, uh, we're incredibly excited about where it might ultimately lead and how it will impact the world, particularly as, as I've described, we see space tech as holding the promise for potentially helping to solve some of the world's most pressing problems, uh, and that ultimately very few parts of our, 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 our lives will remain untouched by, uh, by, by Space's PC moment. So just to wrap up, I thought I'd give you a couple of examples of some of the businesses that we've been investing in to help you understand um, some of the, the, the amazing developments. So I've alluded to Spire already. Uh, so uh, they build all of their satellites in Glasgow, uh, which as a consequence means that, believe it or not, uh, there are more satellites built in Glasgow than anywhere else in the world. Uh, as of today, Spire now has more than 50 satellites in, in orbit. To put that in context, there are only five countries in the history of the space age who've put up more satellites, and Spire started putting up satellites less than four years ago. So what are they doing with these satellites? Well, their satellites are, are essentially listening to, to the Earth uh, and collecting uh, uh, RF signals. So you can, use it to, you can use their satellites to track every ship that's moving around the oceans. You can use it to track every aircraft as it's flying through the skies. Uh, and amazingly, you can actually use it to capture amazing new data sets uh, about the Earth's atmosphere that ultimately give Spire the opportunity to build the world's most uh, uh, comprehensive uh, and hyper-local weather forecast. Uh, ISI, I think, is a great example of, of, of what, the, uh, uh, what the implications are of the changes of cost of access to space. 
Uh, two 22-year-olds dropped out of university with no prior experience in, in space, went to Silicon Valley, uh, uh, pitched to a bunch of investors, saying that they were going to do what everyone else thought was impossible, raised some money, and, and a few years later had, had actually shown that they could do what, what's impossible. That kind of story happens all the time in Silicon Valley. It doesn't happen very often in, in, in Europe, and it absolutely has happened with ISI. So what these guys have done is to build a satellite that uses radar to see through clouds um, that uh, previously cost $100 million. Uh, they've now built one and launched one and shown it can work for a hundredth of that cost, now meaning that it's not just the US government and the UK government that can afford this data. It's developing countries uh, for disaster management. Uh, it's private companies um, uh, looking to, to, to use it for a whole range of applications. Uh, Altitude Angel, which is a Reading-based business. So this is building the, the essentially the global brain or data exchange that is going to allow uh, millions of drones to fly autonomously through our skies. For, for that vision to come a reality, for us to be able to look outside this window and see lots of Amazon drones buzzing around, um, they've got to know where all the other drones are, and just as importantly, they've got to know where all of the, the, the manned aviation is. So that's what Altitude Angel is, is, is building, really one of the, these key building blocks for, for the future of, uh, of, of autonomous drone uh, flight, and again, that relies very heavily on the kind of space data that I've been talking about. Uh, and Trans Robotics, which uh, is one of our more recent investments, so they've taken the Wi-Fi chip that's in your, in your mobile phone and turned that into a super low cost, super powerful, super light radar. So what does that mean? Well, it means that it can solve the problem of machines being able to see where they're going, being able to actually accurately map its surroundings and identify where everything is. So that's very relevant for drones, it's very relevant for autonomous cars, uh, but it's also amazingly equally relevant for Pokemon Go. So being able to use this to improve uh, your augmented reality experience, uh, as well as a whole, host of, a whole host of other things. So a great example there of taking commercial off-the-shelf technology and uh, repurposing it for some amazing space-related applications. And then last but not least, this is a business that's still in stealth, so I can't talk about it too much, but a, a UK-based company that is doing something really exciting and, and highly relevant um, uh, 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 to, to, to blockchain. So they have... Um, I'm going to have to try and use my words carefully here, a, a, a new form of technology that um, uses laser communications through a constellation of, of satellites um, to deliver quantum safe uh, communication, which in the context of the, the future of the blockchain, maybe not in the next five years, but certainly in the next 10 years, actually uh, uh, poses some profound problems that could potentially fundamentally undermine uh, the entire basis of having a trustless network. So that's a business that we've invested in specifically because it has some relevance to, to, to this community. Right, and then just to, to round up, in terms of where we see opportunities of segueing space and, uh, and, and crypto, I think the way that we look at this is, is really through the paradigm of what can you only do from space, which I've already talked about, and, and, and what are distributed ledgers um, uniquely useful for? So some of the examples we've seen that that I think kind of play to this. Um, there's a whole bunch of people who are looking at, at, at actually putting, uh, putting blockchain servers in space for some fairly obvious reasons. There's people that are fusing the kind of data that you can capture about the Earth um, in, in terms of looking at what's happened with, uh, with uh, for example, if there's been a flood, uh, and, and using that to, to create um, automated smart contracts for the paying out of, of insur insurance settlements. I think that's a great example of of the direction the industry is going to go in. Uh, by extension, likewise, Internet of Things sensor networks that need satellite communications to, to communicate, but will ultimately probably involve some, some form of blockchain te technology. Uh, I've talked about the company I've just invested in that's using secure satcoms as a way of securing the future of, of the blockchain. Uh, and then I guess the, the somewhat dreaded uh, ICO words, um, which I guess we can probably spend a few minutes talking about, um, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of different initiatives that are, that are underway, um, some more speculative than others, frankly, uh, around funding some of the things that I'm talking about. So be that space exploration, um, uh, uh, more altruistic aims of, of, of removing space debris, uh, or trying to crowdsource the development of interesting space technology. Uh, those are all things that, that we have seen and, and looked at, um, uh, albeit some of them with, with some degrees of skepticism. Okay, so that was, uh, that was everything. I'm very happy to spend a few moments taking any questions if anyone had any.